Welcome back on the banks of Plum Creek. We are up to chapter 38 and there's only 41 chapters. So I think we're going to finish our story today. Amazing with all the snow. I can't even imagine. Okay. That's where we left off. Now chapter 38 is called the day of games. It was late next morning when Ma called Laura to breakfast. The storm was fiercer and wilder. Furry white frost covered the windows, and inside that good tight house, the sugary snow was all over the floor and on the bed covers. Upstairs was so cold that Laura snatched up her clothes and hurried down to dress by the stove. Mary was already dressed and buttoning Carrie up. Hot cornmeal mush and milk with the new white bread and butter were on the table. The daylight was dim white. Frost was thick on every window pane. Ma shivered over the stove. Well, she said, the stock must be fed. She put on Pa's boots and jumper and wrapped herself in a big shawl. She told Mary and Laura that she would be gone longer this time because she must water the horse and the cattle. When she was gone, Mary was scared and still, but Laura could not bear to be still. Come on, she told Mary, we've got the work to do. They washed and wiped the dishes. They shook the snow off their bed covers and made their bed. They warmed again by the stove. Then they polished it. And Mary cleaned the wood box while Laura swept the floor. Ma had not come back. Laura took the dust cloth and wiped the window sills and the benches and every curve of Ma's willow rocking chair. She climbed on a bench and very carefully wiped the clock shelf and the clock and the little brown spotted dog and her own jewel box with the gold teapot and saucer on top but she did not touch the pretty china shepherdess standing on the bracket that Pa had carved for Ma. Ma allowed no one to touch the shepherdess. While Laura was dusting, Mary combed Carrie's hair and put the red checkered cloth on the table and got the school books and the slate. At last, the wind howled into the lean-to with a cloud of snow and Ma. Her skirt and her shawl were frozen stiff with ice. She had to draw water from the well for the horses and Spot and the calf. The wind had flung the water on her and the cold had frozen her clothes. She had not been able to get to the barn with enough water, but under the icy shawl, she had saved almost all the milk. She rested a while and said she must bring in wood. Mary and Laura begged her to let them bring it in, but Ma said, no, you girls are not big enough and you'd get lost. You do not know what this storm is like. I'll get the wood. You open the front door for me. She piled wood high on the wood box and around it while they opened and shut the door for her. Then she rested and they mopped up the puddles of snow melting from the wood. You are good girls, Ma told them. She looked around at the house and praised them for doing the work so nicely while she was gone. Now, she said, you, must, you may study your lessons. Laura and Mary sat down with their books. Laura looked steadily at the page, but she could not study. She heard the storm howling and she heard things in the air, moaning and shrieking. Snow swish swished against the windows. She tried not to think of Pa. Suddenly the words on the page smeared together and a drop of water splashed on them. She was ashamed. It would be shameful even for Carrie to cry and Laura was eight years old. She looked sidewise to make sure that Mary had not seen the tear fall. Mary's eyes were shut so tight and her whole face was crinkled and Mary's mouth was wobbling. I don't believe we want lessons, girls, Ma said. Suppose we don't do anything today but play. Think what we'll play first. Pussy in the corner. Would you like that? Oh, yes, they said. Laura stood in one corner, Mary in the other, and Carrie in the third. There were only three corners because the stove was in the fourth. Ma stood in the middle of the floor and cried, poor pussy wants a corner. Then all at once they ran out of their corners and they each tried to get into another corner. Jack was excited. Ma dodged into Mary's corner and that left Mary out to be the poor pussy. Then Laura felt over Jack, fell over Jack and that left Laura out. Carrie ran laughing to the wrong corner at first, but soon she learned. They all ran until they were gasping from running and shouting and laughing. Then they had to rest and Ma said, Bring me the slate and I'll tell you a story. Why do you need the slate to tell a story? Mary asked as she laid the slate on Mom's lap, Ma's lap. 
You'll see, said Ma, and she told this story. Okay, so as she's telling the story, she's adding things to draw the picture. So I'm gonna try to read it to you so you guys can see it. I think what I'm gonna have to do is take a picture of this page and post it, because I don't think I can read it and show it to you at the same time, although I'll try. Okay. I'll try it like this, this might work. Far in the woods, there was a pond like this. The pond was full of fishies like this. Down below the pond lived two homesteaders, each in a little tent because they had not built their houses yet. They went off into the pond to fish and they made crooked paths. A little way from the pond lived an old man and an old woman in a little house with a window. One day, the old woman went to the pond to get a pail of water and she saw the fishes all flying out of the pond like this. The old woman ran back as fast as she could go to tell the old man, all the fishes are flying out of the pond. The old man stuck his long nose out of the house to get a good look. And he said, Psh, it's nothing but tadpoles. It's a bird, Carrie yelled. And she clapped her hands and laughed until she rolled off the footstool. So that's pretty clever. Lover trick. I will take a picture of that and post it. Maybe you guys could try to make up a story that tells, that draws, a, um, ends up with a picture at the end. That'd be really fun. Okay. <clears throat> it's a bird, Carrie yelled, and she clapped her hands and laughed until she rolled off the footstool. Laura and Mary laughed too and coaxed. Tell us another one, Ma, please. Well, if I must, said Ma, and she began. This is the house that Jack built for two pieces of money. She covered both sides of the slate with pictures of that story. Ma let Mary and Laura read it and look at the pictures as long as they liked. Then she asked, Mary, can you tell that story? Yes, Mary clap, clapped and answered. Ma wiped the slate clean and gave it to Mary. Write it on the slate then, she said. And Laura and Carrie, I have new playthings for you. She gave her thimble to Laura and Mary's thimble to Carrie. And she showed them that pressing the thimbles into the frost on the windows made perfect circles. They could make pictures on the windows. With little symbol circles, Laura made a Christmas tree. She made birds flying. She made a log house with smoke coming out of the chimney. She even made a roly-poly man and a roly-poly woman. Carrie just made circles. When Laura finished her window and Mary looked up from the slate, the room was dusky. Ma smiled at them. We've been so busy, we forgot all about dinner, she said. Come and eat your supper now. Don't you have to do the chores first? Laura asked. Not tonight, said Ma. It was so late when I fed the stock this morning that I gave them enough to last till tomorrow. Maybe the storm will not be so bad then. All at once, Laura felt miserable and so did Mary and Carrie whimpered, I want Pa. Hush, Carrie, Ma said, and Carrie hushed. We must not worry about Pa, Mom said firmly. She lighted the lamp, but she did not set it in the window. Come and eat your suppers now, she said again, and then we'll all go to bed. Chapter 39, the third day. All night, the house shook and jarred in the wind. Next day, the storm was worse than ever. The noises of the wind were much more terrible and the snow struck the windows with an icy rattle. Ma made ready to go to the stable. Eat your breakfast, girls, and be careful with the fire, she said. And then she was gone into the storm. After a long time, she came back and another day began. It was a long, dark day. They huddled close to the stove and the cold pressed against their backs. Carrie was fretful and Ma's, and Ma's smile was tired. Laura and Mary studied hard, but they did not know their lessons very well. The hands of the clock moved so slowly that they did not seem to move at all. At last, the gray light faded away and the night was there again. The lamplight shone on the board walls and the white frosted windows. If Pa had been there, he would have played the fiddle and they would have been cozy and happy. Come, come, Ma said, we mustn't sit like this. Would you like to play cat's cradle? Jack had left his supper untouched. He sighed mournfully in his corner. Laura and Mary looked at each other and then Laura said, no, thank you, Ma, we want to go to bed. She cuddled her back tight against Mary's back in the icy cold bed. The storm was shaking the house. It creaked and shuddered all over. Rattling snow scoured the roof. 
Laura's head was tucked well under the covers, but the sound in the storm were worse than walls. Cold tears ran down her cheeks. Aw. Chapter 40, The Fourth Day. In the morning, those sounds were gone from the wind. It was blowing with a steady wailing scream, and the house stood still. But the roaring fire in the stove gave, heart, gave hardly any heat. The cold is worse, Ma said. Don't try to do the housework properly. Wrap up in your shawls and keep Carrie with you close to the stove. Soon after, Ma came back from the stable. The frost on the eastern window glowed faintly yellow. Laura ran to breathe on it and scratch away the ice until she made a peephole. Outdoors, the sun was shining. Ma looked out and then Mary and Laura took turns looking out at the snow blowing in the waves over the ground, blowing in waves over the ground. The sky looked like ice. Even the air looked cold above that fast blowing flood of snow and the sunshine that came through the peephole was no warmer than the shadow. Than a shadow, no warmer than a shadow. Sidewise from the peephole, Laura glimpsed something dark. A furry big animal was wading deep in the blowing snow. A bear, she thought. It shambled behind the door in the corner of the house and darkened the front window. Ma, she cried. The door opened. The snowy furry animal came in. Pa's eyes looked out of its face. Pa's voice said, have you been good girls since I've been gone? Mary ran to him. Laura and Mary, Ma ran to him, sorry. Ma ran to him. Laura and Mary and Carrie ran to him crying and laughing. Ma helped him out of his coat. The fur was full of snow that showered onto the floor. Pa let the coat drop. Charles, Ma said, you're frozen. Just about, Pa answered, and I'm as hungry as a wolf. Let me sit down by the fire, Caroline, and please feed me. His face was thin and his eyes were large. He sat shivering close to the fire, I'm sorry, close to the oven and said he was only cold. He was not frostbitten. Ma quickly warmed some of the bean broth and gave it to him. That's good, he said. That warms up a fellow. Ma pulled off his boots and put his feet up to the heat from the oven. Charles, Ma asked, did you, were you? She stood smiling with her mouth trembling. Now, Caroline, don't you ever worry about me, said Pa. I'm bound to come home to take care of you and the girls. He lifted Carrie to his knee and put his arm around Laura and the other arm around Mary. What did you think, Mary? I thought you would come home, Mary answered. That's the girl. And Laura? I didn't think you were with Mr. Fitch telling stories, said Laura. I, I kept wishing hard. There you are, Caroline. How could a fellow fail to get home? Pa asked Ma. Give me some more of that broth and I'll tell you all about it. They waited while Pa rested and ate bean broth with bread and drank hot tea. His hair and his beard were wet with the snow melting in them. Ma dried them with a towel. He took her hand and drew her down beside him and asked, Caroline, do you know what this weather means? It means we'll have a bumper crop of wheat next year. Does it, Charles? Ma asked. We won't have any grasshoppers next summer. They say in town that grasshoppers come only when the summers are hot and dry and the winters are mild. We are getting so much snow now that we're bound to have fine crops come summer. That's good, Charles, Ma said quickly, quietly. Well, they were talking, well, they were talking all about this in the store, but I knew I ought to start home. Just as I was leaving, Fitch showed me the buffalo coat. He got it cheap from a man who went east on the last train running and had to have money in his pocket to buy his ticket. So Fitch said I could have the coat for $10. $10 is a lot of money, but I'm glad you got the coat, Charles, said Ma. As it turned out, it's lucky I did, though I didn't know it then. But going to town, the wind went right through me. It was cold enough to freeze the nose off a brass monkey and seems like my old coat didn't even strain that wind. So when Finch told me to pay him when I sell my trapped furs next spring, I put that buffalo coat over my old one. As soon as I was out on the prairie, I saw the cloud in the Northwest, but it was so small and so far away that I thought I could beat it home. Pretty soon I began to run, but I was no more than halfway home when the storm struck. I couldn't see my own hand before my face. 
it would be all right if these blizzard winds didn't come from all directions at once. I didn't know how they, I don't know how they do it. When a storm comes from the northwest, a man ought to be able to go straight north by keeping the wind on his left cheek. But a fellow can't do anything about the direction in a blizzard like that. Still, it seemed I ought to be able to walk straight ahead, even if I couldn't see or tell directions. So I kept walking straight ahead, I thought, till I knew I was lost. I had come a good two miles without getting to the creek, and I had no idea which way to turn. The only thing to do was to keep on going. I had to walk until the storm quit. I knew if I stopped, I'd freeze. So I set myself out to walk, out walk that storm. I walked and walked. I couldn't see any more than if I had been out. Sorry, my dog did that. I couldn't see any more than if I had been stone blind. I could hear nothing but the wind. I kept on walking in that white blur. I don't know if you noticed, there seemed to be voices howling and things screaming overhead in the blizzard. Yes, Pa, I heard them, Laura said. So did I, said Mary, and Ma nodded. And balls of fire, said Laura. Balls of fire, asked Pa. That will keep, Laura, said Ma. Go on, Charles. What did you do then? I kept on walking, Pa answered. I walked till the white blur turned gray and then black, and then I knew it was night. I figured I'd been walking four hours, and these blizzards last three days and nights, but I kept on walking. Pa stopped, and Ma said, I had the lamp burning in the window for you to see. I didn't see it, said Pa. I kept straining my eyes to see something, but all I saw was dark. All of a sudden, everything gave way under me, and I went straight down. Must have been ten feet. It seemed farther. I had no idea what happened or where I was, but I was out of the wind. The blizzard was yelling and shrieking overhead, but the air was fairly still where I was. I felt around me. There was snow banked up as high as I could reach on three sides of me. And on the other side, there was a kind of wall of bare ground sloping back at the bottom. It didn't take long for me to figure out that I had walked off the bank of some gully somewhere on the side of the prairie. I crawled back under the bank and there I was with solid ground at my back and overhead, snug as a bear in his den. I didn't believe I would freeze out there out of the wind with the buffalo coat to keep me warm in my body. So I just curled up in it and went to sleep, being pretty tired. My, I was glad that I had that coat and good warm cap with ear laps and that extra pair of thick socks, Caroline. When I woke up, I could hear the blizzard, but faintly. There was solid, I hear my dog again. You're listening to the story too, Scout. Read to your dog. Read to your dog, yay. Look at his gray beard, getting old. <laughs> You're funny, Scout. Okay. Um, when I woke up, I could hear the blizzard, but faintly. There was solid snow in front of me, coated over with ice where my breath had melted. The blizzard had filled up the hole I had made when I fell in. There must have been six feet of snow over me, but the air was good. I moved my arms and legs and fingers and toes and felt my nose and ears to make sure that I was not freezing. I could still hear the storm, so I went to sleep again. How long has it been, Caroline? Three days and three nights, said Ma. This is the fourth day. Then Pa asked Mary and Laura, do you know what day it is? It's Sunday, Mary guessed. It's the day before Christmas, said Ma. Laura and Mary had forgotten all about Christmas, Laura asked. Did you sleep all that time, Pa? No, said Pa. I kept on sleeping and waking up hungry and sleeping some more till I woke up just about starved. I was bringing home some oyster crackers for Christmas. They were in a pocket of the buffalo coat. I took a handful of those crackers out of the paper bag and ate them. I felt out in the snow and took a handful. And I ate that for a drink. Then all I could do was lie there and wait for the storm to stop. I tell you, Caroline, it was mighty hard to do that, thinking of you and the girls and knowing you would go out in the blizzard to do the chores. But I knew I could not get home until the blizzard stopped. And here's a picture of Pa in the snow cave that he like fell into and he's eating the crackers. Amazing.
So I waited a long time till I was so hungry again that I ate the rest of those oyster crackers. They were no bigger than the end of my thumb. One of them wasn't half a mouthful and the whole half pound of them wasn't very filling. Then I went on waiting, sleeping some more. I guessed it was night again. Whenever I woke, I listened closely and I could hear the dim sound of the blizzard. I could tell by the sound that the snow was getting thicker over me, but the air was still good in my den. The heat of my body was keeping me from freezing. I tried to sleep all I could, but I was so hungry that I kept waking up. Finally, I was too hungry to sleep at all. Girls, I was bound and determined. I would not do it, but after some time, I did. I took that old bag out of the inside of my old of my old overcoat, and I bit, I ate every bit of the Christmas candy. I'm sorry. Laura hugged him from one side, and Mary hugged him from the other. They hugged him hard, and Laura said, Oh, Pa, I'm so glad you did. So am I, Pa, so am I, said Mary. They were truly glad. Well, Pa said, we'll have a big wheat crop next year, and you girls won't have to wait till Christmas for candy. Was it good, Pa? Laura asked. Did, it, did you feel better after you ate it? It was very good, and I felt much better, said Pa. I went right to sleep, and I must have slept most of yesterday and last night. Suddenly, I sat up, wide awake. I could not hear a sound. Now, was I buried so deep in the snow that I couldn't hear the blizzard? Or had the blizzard stopped? I listened hard. It was so still that I could hear the silence. Girls, I began digging on that snow like a badger. I wasn't slow in digging out of that den. I came scrambling through the top of that snowbank, and where do you suppose I was? I was on the bank of Plum Creek, just above the place where we set the fish trap, Laura. Why, I can see that place from the window, said Laura. Yes, and I could see this house, said Pa, all that long, terrible time. He had been so near. The lamp in the window had not been able to shine through that blizzard at all, or else Pa would have seen the light. My legs were so stiff and cramped that I could hardly stand up on them, said Pa. But I saw this house and I started for home just as fast as I could go. And here I am, he finished, hugging Laura and Mary. Then he went to the big buffalo coat and he took out of one of its pockets a flat square edge can in a bright tin and he asked, what do you think I have brought you for a Christmas dinner? They could not guess. Oysters, said Pa. Nice, fresh oysters. They were frozen solid when I got them, and they're frozen solid yet. Better put them in the lean-to, Caroline, so they'll stay that way till tomorrow. Laura touched the can. It was as cold as ice. I ate up the oyster crackers, and I ate up the Christ Christmas candy, but by jinx, said Pa, I brought the Christmas oysters home. Aw, and this is the last chapter. Chapter 41 is called Christmas Eve. Pa went early to do the chores that evening, and Jack went with him, staying close to his heels. Jack did not intend to lose sight of Pa again. They came in cold and snowy. Pa stamped the snow from his feet and hung his old coat with his cap on the nail by the lean-to door. The wind is rising again, he said. We'll have another blizzard before morning. Just so you're here, Charles. I don't care how much, much it stormed, said Ma. Jack lay down contentedly, and Pa sat warming his hand by the stove. Laura, he said, if you bring me my fiddle box, I'll play you a tune. Laura brought the fiddle box to him. Pa tuned the fiddle and rosined the bow, and then while Ma cooked supper, he filled the house with his music. Pa's voice rollicked with a rollicking tune and Carrie laughed and clapped her hands and Laura's feet were dancing and the fiddle changed the tune and Pa began to sing. And he sang a sweet song about Lily Dale. Pa glanced at Ma busy at the stove while Ma and Laura sat listening and the fiddle slipped into frolicking up and down. It was a calm still night and the moon's pale light shone soft over the hill and dale. Mary put the dishes on, the dishes on, the dishes on. Mary put the dishes on, we'll all take tea. And what shall I do, Pa? Laura cried while Mary ran to get the plates and cups from the cupboard. The fiddle kept going and Pa kept singing down all the steps they had just gone up. 
Laura, take them off again, off again, off again. Laura, clear the table when they've all gone away. So Nor Laura knew that Mary was to set the table for supper and Laura was to clear it afterward. The wind was screaming fiercer and louder outside. The snow swirled, swish, swishing against the windows. But Pa's fiddle sang and the warm lamp lighted the house. The dishes made small clinking sounds as Mary set the table. Carrie rocked herself in the rocking chair and Ma went gently between the table and the stove. In the middle of the table, she set a milk pan full of beautiful brown baked beans. And now from the oven, she took out the square baking pan full of golden cornbread. The rich brown smell and the sweet golden smell curled deliciously together in the air. And Pa's fiddle laughed and he sang, I'm Captain Jinx of the Horse Marines. I fed my horse on corn and beans, although tis far beyond my means, for I'm Captain Jinx of the Horse, Ma horse Marines, Captain of the Army. Laura patted Jack's furry smooth forehead and scratched his ears for him. And then with both hands, she gave his head a quick, happy squeeze. Everything was good. Grasshoppers were gone, and next year, Pa could harvest the wheat. Tomorrow was Christmas with oyster stew for dinner. There would be no presents. There would be no candy. But Laura could not think of anything she wanted, and she was so glad that the Christmas candy had helped to bring Pa home safely again. Supper is ready, Ma said in her gentle voice. Pa laid the fiddle in his box. He stood up and looked around at them all. His blue eyes shone at them. Look, Caroline, he said, how Laura's eyes are shining. The end. Oh my gosh, I always cry at the end of those books. Um, it was so good, wasn't it? What an amazing life they had. And they were so strong and resilient to get through all those trials and tribulations that they got through and it just is a good reminder always um that the best things in life are just the simple things like being safe and snug and healthy in your own cozy house so um i hope you guys enjoyed that and i will read a new book for you really soon we'll be starting charlotte's web as i told you on the webcast but if anybody's interested in hearing more of these stories, I've been reading Little House in I, Big Woods. I finished that one and I'm reading now Little House on the Prairie. So um, I will post my YouTube channel and you can just go to that. And when you go to it, you will see that um, all of the recordings I've been doing are there and you can tell by the way they're labeled what story it is. So if you have time to listen to more and you wanna listen to more, you definitely can, but stay tuned for our next classic read aloud, which is Charlotte's Web. Okay, goodbye for now. Miss you all.